Has the market changed its mind about what the Fed may do next? Welcome to Financial Stockholm. I'm Christopher Crystal, and today we have uh, the CEO of uh, Bliss Paddle, Johan Stoll van Holstein, uh, von Holsten, and uh, excuse my pronunciation. But uh, so Johan's going to tell us a little bit about Bliss Paddle and the trends and what he sees. So uh, Johan, please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Hi, nice to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about paddle, which is the fastest growing sport in the world. Uh, it's the fastest growing sport in the world for a reason. It is the most accessible, the most social, most um, enjoyable sport that has come up and for 100 years. Um, and it's um, it took off from Spain about 40 years ago, and it's now the second largest sport in Spain. 9.8% of the population are playing it regularly on a regular basis. And Spain is, as many people know, one of the most sporty countries in the world. Really, really good at almost all sports. Um, and um, it's taken off over the last couple of years by expanding into the Scandinavian market, Sweden predominantly. And Swedes are now taking it out, out over Europe, and it's going like crazy all over Europe. The first courts are being put up in the States, and me and some other Swedes are trying to bring this uh, to Asia. And uh, I think I'm bringing it in a larger scale than my, my uh, competitors. Um, and I'm focusing on Southeast Asian markets where there is a lot of expats that will cut the cost of customer acquisition costs. It will be very easy to find people who already know the sport. You don't really have to reinvent the wheel again. And uh, the potential is enormous. Uh, Sweden got its first court in 2009. Today, 23 years later, there's 6,000 courts which on one hand probably is 1,000 courts too many, but it means that over the next 10 years, paddle is gonna grow like absolutely crazy all over Southeast Asia. And Asians love racket sports. They are dominant in the world of table tennis, ping pong, uh, badminton, squash. Uh, not very good in tennis though, as they are too short and the rackets are too heavy. It's too far to run. Um, and that's not being racist at all. It's a matter of fact. That's why you've never seen any Asians, apart from some Japanese women, play really good tennis. Um, you had Tim Chang from America, who was a very good tennis player, but he only played on clay and never left the baseline. So it is, it is a heavy and difficult sport. And if you compare uh, tennis, the largest racket sport, with uh, paddle, Paddle is extremely much more um, accessible. Uh, tennis is complex, difficult, hard, uh, really physically strengthful, whilst paddle is, there's no benefit of being really strong. There's no benefit of being really fast. It's, a, it's much more like chess with a sweat where you need to stand right, play it right, which means that you can enjoy it after 15 minutes of going through the rules. And you can play with bad players and good players can play together and have fun. I mean, if you're slightly better than somebody else in tennis, you win 6-0, 6-0, 6-0. You're slightly better than a paddle player, you can still lose. And, um, and you can play women and men, and men can be be women can be better than men uh, in a way that's not so normal in sports, which because sports are normally very physical, and physical men are, of course, more physically developed than women in general. So it is extremely accessible. You can play it for three hours, which means that after such three hours of playing, you um, you want to sit down and socialize. A large part of the of the game is that you actually pay different types of tournament and games within groups. So you can be, if you have 10 courts, you can be 40 people playing for three hours, which means after these three hours, you have a wonderful lunch or dinner and you hang out and you it, it's more social than any other sports I have uh, ever encountered, maybe with the ex exception of uh, slalom, which is, of course, the number one sport in the world coming from a Swede. Um, so the sport per se is, is really, really a fantastic sport. And because of that, I am 100% convinced that this is going to become the largest sport in the world. Americans always want to compare it to a pickerball, but it's, it's of, of another, uh, it's completely another level. If you look at YouTube at the most exciting balls of the year in pick and ball. You go to sleep, watch a bit of, <laughs> of, of paddle, and you'll see how amazing it is with players playing outside with uh, you know playing the ball out of the court. It's, it's an amazing sport. 
Um, and the economies in it, it's very simple to understand. And one center court of tennis where you normally play two players, you get in, you, you, you fit three paddle courts where you always have to be four on each court. So you go from two to 12 people on the same uh, turf at the same time. So the financials are, you know, just talk for themselves. Um, and my focus on association is because of the vast amount of people living there, the huge interest of sports in general, because the governments there are becoming more and more aware of the fact that the people need to be sported to survive and live longer. Um, the, 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 the huge um, density of population, which means they will really love going from two to, four, two, four, to 12 people playing in the same area. Um, the amount of expats that live there, which normally means if you have 2 million expats, like in Singapore, you have half a million men working, 1 million kids in school, and half a million women who don't have working permits, not allowed to work, who needs to fill their day with something to do. Um, they don't know anybody because they're in general, they're there for three years. So when they come down, they need to find a lot of women. They need to hang out and have fun, spend their days. There cannot be a better way to spend your time than to play tennis. Okay, paddle. And um, I can just see how my wife, we're living in Spain, heart of paddle and uh, in Mabea, which is the heart of paddle in Spain, she does nothing but paddle. Uh, and uh, I've never seen a sport engage women in that way. So it's definitely not a, a sport just for women. It's me and my friends would play all the time. Um, but it's um, it, it, because of its social aspects and accessibility, it's a fantastic social sport to uh, conduct. So great potential in terms of growth, very good revenues, um, due to the economies of, of, of how it works and very fast growth. Um, it's a great opportunity. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really like the social dynamic where you can have a mixed uh, group and uh, you have a constant flow. So people aren't sitting around waiting. Um, it's not like golf where you're out for three hours or four hours, and then you have more time if you have it to stay at the restaurant. Um, it's very easy with the paddle where you can all mix at the same time while you're playing and then afterwards. Uh, so that, that's an interesting aspect. And then uh, I also like the soft intro that you can do with the expat community, because then you, you kind of establish a easy run rate, which you can build on with exposure to the local population. I mean, with the customer acquisition cost becomes almost zero because you have you have enough Spanish and Swedish women um, or Argentinians living in these areas to fill a number of, of courts and they've all been longing for it to come there. Um, and you have all these other expat women around Europe that are increasingly so are getting to understand what the sport is and playing it on a regular basis. Sweden is going crazy for it. It's um, and, and um, so it's very, very low cost acquisition cost and there is a foundation to grow upon even if the sport is new to a country. Um, and then because of the social aspects, the way you run the clubs, you will easily get people to come in and start playing. And um, yeah. So, so the expansion model focuses uh, mainly on expat areas where you have a lot of expat Europeans living in countries in Asia. And then you set up the court and you set up the amenities around it. And then, yeah. uh, and then it builds out from there. So let's say like, if you, if you look at Swedish, Sweden as a typical example, in uh, the first 13 years, it went from one court to 6,000 courts. If you look at that with the amount of people you have in, uh, in uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, um, Indonesia, we're talking millions of courts. Um, China, India, you know, millions of courts in the Southeast and Asian markets. Um, and, this is, you, this is gonna grow over the next 15 years. It's gonna be endless needs to just build courts and to organize these clubs. And of course, if you have a large international brand, there is so many benefits and economies of scale that you get through running it that way, that it's gonna be a great benefit for me to establish myself in several markets. You also have the, the huge traveling experience that will go from, Northern Europe to uh, the Southeast Asian markets during winter time for practice and training and uh, and gaming. So you know, there's there's, it's a real no brainer. It's not like an IT company that will go from zero to billions because this is you know this is cash flow driven. It's basically cash flow from day one. We started our first three courts in Singapore about half a year ago. They're all making uh, twenty thousand uh, dollars profit um, a month. 
which means basically we pay the whole investment structure off and in, um, slightly more than a year. Um, and, and then it's a money machine for the next 10 years before there is, there's going to be uh, some kind of reach a level where there, for the first time there will be more courts than necessity. If you have the growth of the sport like this, you'll have too few courts, too many courts, too few courts, too many courts. If you look at yeah. Spain, over the last 40 years, they've had two areas, two times um, where there's been too many courts. And at these times, courts that have low quality, uh, clubs that are too small, that are too way off, um, bad parking, bad quality, whatever else there is, they go bankrupt. And the ones that have location, 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 the ones that have enough courts to play corporate events, um, Americanos, these games where you can be up to 40 people, where you have the restaurants and all of these survive. Um, it's not price sensitive because once you remember you have all your friends there, uh, you accept to pay slightly more. So the profitability in these clubs are high forever. It really, it really grows on the social aspect of it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, that's a fantastic uh, little dynamic of it. Um, and then, uh, but where where you have this with the gyms, and then you have uh, uh, other amenities like restaurants. Are you running those as well, or you're just focusing on the paddle courts? No. So our our goal is to have once the market's mature to a level where it's justifiable, we want to have always want to have clubs with about ten to sixteen courts. Um, and then we always need to have a restaurant and we always need to have a gym. We have massage, we have a chiropractor, there is a shop. We'll run the shop ourselves, we'll run the, the clubs ourselves. We'll have, of course, there's a huge part of the academy of you know educating kids, of educating people who want to become mature. So that the whole training structure is central. We run that. And um, we're very conscious about how and what we eat. So it's, it, it, it cannot be a three-star Michelin restaurant. It needs to be something that caters to somebody who's doing sports who might eat there three, four times a week. So prices have to be on a justifiable level. Quality always really nutritious and good so that, you know, we, it's, it's a sports club. You're not going to become, you know, gain too much in weight with us. Um, so we will have strong ideas of how we want the restaurant to work and run, what type of foods and stuff. But we want somebody who's a professional running a restaurant to run it for us. And we want yeah. the same type of restaurant in all the restaurants, all the clubs where we are. So we want to find a partner for the fitness center who will run the fitness center because they're professional doing that. I'm, I'm a great uh, believer in, in the, the and, um, admirer of any type of skill. Um, and I think that, you know, shoemaker should do shoes um, and uh, restaurants, people should run restaurants. Uh, it's yeah. a fantastic way of losing money to get into the restaurant industry because you like food. Um, so, yeah. uh, so I will only work with professionals, but I'll find my partners to work out and grow this together with. Yeah, let experts be experts. And uh, that's generally the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, at experience. least that's what I found. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, you don't need to call in a consultant for that. No. Um, okay. And so, so where are you right now and, and what's happening? So we uh, tried to establish ourselves in, um, in, in um, the Middle East because it's fairly mature markets. They've been growing very fast for a couple of years, but they have lousy clubs. Uh, they're all too small. There are lousy quality. There is too low ceilings. There's bad sounds, absorbing systems, bad ventilations. So Dubai really, really needs a club that the one I wanted to put up, but I haven't been able to find the money to finance that because people don't understand what they need in Dubai and think that it's uh, over-established already, which is completely wrong. You can just look at Spain, which has had this for 40 years, which is now the second largest sport in Spain with almost 10% of the population playing it. They're still building courts here. But here they're building the clubs always with the large and all the other amenities that I mentioned before, like gym and restaurant such. So anyway, we decided to more or less pull out of, of um, Middle East. We might have one smaller club that we're still looking at uh, financing, which is an outdoor club of 10 courts with the restaurant, yoga. Um, and we're focusing entirely on Southeast Asia, where we can see it's very easy to cheaply and fast get our clubs up and start making money. And the more clubs we have up there, um, the more profitable will be because we'll be able to get the economies of scale that we need. And we have, of course, all the contract with the suppliers and the courts and stuff. But we also you know, want to leverage on having the trainers and getting everything together and doing the tournaments in different parts of the town and stuff like that. 
So we'll grow there as fast as we can. And, um, and when the markets start to mature, we'll be the first putting in the clubs that has the amenities to, to be successful in a long perspective. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, that's smart, right? I mean, you're focusing on where it's better to do than uh, trying to climb the mountain and push that rock up over you and having sure. it keep rolling back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, that, that's a very good explanation. And so how, how are you doing this uh, for the expansion in, uh, uh, in Asia? Well, we're looking at raising money for the Southeast Martin over the next couple of weeks and months. Um, so any interest, I'm happy to send the information to them of how it looks. And um, we have, as I said, we have three courts up and running in Singapore today. Um, we're looking at opening another three courts in a very strategic and good position. And we're negotiating with another couple of places where we want to put them up. Uh, we're also looking at Jahor, KL, Jakarta. Um, and um, there's a lot of places there where they really need to get our courts up and uh, where there's yeah. huge potential of doing some fun stuff and uh thank you very much Owen. it's been uh, enlightening for me thank you thank you very much hope to see you on the paddle courts yeah there we go <laughs> okay. thanks